Thomas, what's the value of this document being signed here today in Geneva? Well, I think it's tremendous. I think it's really historic because we have representatives, senior representatives of the major Christian families uniting together to, to present this to the general public. So this is really historic. It's one of the first times something like this has happened in history, or at least in a very, very long time. I hope our historians work on that question to say just exactly how historic this is. But this is really a big event because here we have the senior people from the different Christian families speaking together on a very important issue of our time. But for evangelicals, evangelism is such a critical part of our ethos and our sense of call. Is there a danger that in working together with the Vatican and the World Council, that evangelicals will water down their sense of call to make Christ known to the nations? It shouldn't if they look at what we say. What we've said in this document really reflects the core concerns that we have as evangelical Christians. People need the gospel. That's why missions is important. People are, this, you know, our world is lost and needs Christ. And we can say that in an intelligent manner. But simultaneously, when we talk about the need for Christ, we're saying these people are made in God's image and therefore we should present the gospel with respect for the God-given dignity of each person. Therefore, we, this flows from the core of what we believe as Christians. I'm just delighted that Christians from all the different families are joining with us and saying this because this reflects what we as evangelicals have to say and I'm just super pleased that so many other Christians are saying, okay, fine, we can say this too. But this really is, comes from the core of our evangelical beliefs. People need the gospel, but they are made in the image of God, therefore they should be respected while we present the gospel to them. So in the line of documents, treaties, uh, agreements signed in the church with the various bodies over the years, where does this stand? How historic might this be? Well, that's a big risk to say too much there, because I don't know how, if the Lord tarries, if our grandchildren through the 10th generation are reading this, that's their decision, if the Lord tarries. But this might be as important as the great uh, creeds of the church. Uh, I hope that in time this becomes as standard as, say, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed ha has been in the history of the church that every Christian knows these sorts of things, that this becomes a standard part of Christian teaching that appears in every handbook of every mission agency and every Bible college and seminary has this, has this or something very similar to it as a standard part of what they present in all of their documents, all of their websites. What might this do for the actual witness of the gospel in today's generation? Well, it, it says that we have to present the gospel in a quality manner. That how we present the gospel has to flow out of the core of what we believe about people, about their God-given needs, but their God-given dignity as well. And so I hope this increases the quality of what we're doing very substantially in the whole missionary movement. What does it seek to prevent? It seeks to prevent abuses. Now, and, and we, we have already in place some standards of how we treat people, but this raises the bar in saying, we, we don't want to have abuses of people, uh, the abuse of God-given dignity, while we're presenting the gospel to people. We want how we present the gospel to flow out of what we believe as so Christians. So what abuses is it trying to prevent? Manipulation. Um, for, you know, we don't want to be manipulating people to... to Some have Christians. talked about the danger of us having rice, what's called rice Christians. What does that mean? Well, if there's been the claim from time to time that in a crisis situation that our humanitarian aid efforts have been made somehow contingent on people claiming to be Christians, we don't want that. We want to extend, extend the love of Jesus in, pra in practical ways when people need that and simultaneously to offer the gospel. But we should never say, you know, you have to claim to be a Christian in order to accept our humanitarian aid. That's not the way we should talk. We do both. And of course there's some connection, but we don't want to say you have to become a Christian in order to accept our rice, if that's the situation. That's not the way we want to 
be as Christians. We want to do both. People need Jesus. People need other practical help as well. We do both simultaneously. But let's not say people have to pretend to be Christians. That's not real faith anyway. Real faith is always a result of people responding personally to the gospel, the Holy Spirit working in that engagement. And we, we, don't, we want to present, we want to encourage, we want to convince people of Christ, but not manipulate, not control, not to f abuse them, not to force them. Otherwise, faith isn't faith. Thank you. Thank you very much.